Well, thank you very much. I've got far too many slides. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to go straight ahead, please. And I may be a little bit fast, but I think you'll like the theme. So can I just show which, which, which is the pointer? The green one. Oh, this one here. Okay. So I wrote this book. Many of you may have read it, and you will know that in the book it says all athletes must be advised to eat high-carbohydrate diets, both in training, etc. as high-carbohydrate diets are now considered ideal for both health and sport. And I apologize, I was 100% wrong. So, and despite running all these marathons, I still managed to develop type 2 diabetes. So following the conventional guidelines was not clearly not for me, as Gary shows. So why did I think that carbohydrates were important? Well, because I was funded by the industry to study carbohydrates. So obviously, I'm going to think carbohydrates are important. So what did I do for 20 years or so? We studied the metabolism during prolonged exercise. So we measured glycogen changes in liver and muscle and inactive muscle. And we didn't measure triglycerides. I'll explain why not. And so we were doing all these studies to see what happens when you exercise for prolonged periods, where does the energy come from? And our real focus was, guess what? It's what you put in your mouth because that's what you get paid to study because you might come up with a new product that can make the athletes go even faster. So that was the focus. So we did all these studies and we even measured lactate oxidation. So we're measuring all these complex things in, in great detail. And so this was a typical study and here you see, sorry, uh, let me just go back again. So here was a typical study done by my PhD student. And so we had people exercise for three hours and we measured exactly where was the energy coming from, from fat, from blood glucose, or from muscle glycogen lactate. And we studied people when they were unloaded with carbohydrates and when they were carbohydrate loaded. And what you notice is that during exercise, you use up your glycogen so that the glycogen becomes less of a fuel Glucose stays pretty much the same for the whole of exercise. In fact, it probably increases, and fat oxidation increases dramatically. But when you carbohydrate load, you reduce your fat oxidation for all the reasons that Gary has just told you. And we realize now, when I look back 20 years later, it seems that we wanted to prevent all fat oxidation. But we couldn't see that at the time, nor do many still today. That seems to be the focus. If you watch all the slides, we were inhibiting fat oxidation, and that seemed to be the goal. Why? Because carbohydrates make you run fast. You don't want to burn fats. That's going to harm you. You've got to burn carbohydrate. So here's another study where we, look, we compared people just ingesting water versus ingesting carbohydrates. And we were able to quantify how much carbohydrate came from the exogenous sources, i.e. what they had ingested. And we found, gosh, you know, we can spare liver glycogen because then we're taking it exogenously, so that will allow us to run even faster and further. And always you can see that the goal seems to be maximum to maximize carbohydrate use and spare glycogen by increasing exogenous glucose delivery. And we showed that you can oxidize at least 60 grams an hour from ingesting. But clearly, we forgot the best way to spare muscle glycogen use is to burn more fat. But that wasn't the thing we were thinking about at the time. And I worked with some world-class athletes, and this is the best athlete I ever worked with. And he won the Comrades Marathon, which is a 56-mile race. He set the American world record for 80 kilometers. And I got him to say this. It's not possible for me to run my best in a long-distance race without ingesting a high-carbohydrate drink, especially for the last few hours of the race. And in fact, it was true because he did better when he ingested that. And uh, so then we decided, well, gosh, you know, if you need carbohydrates, why don't we produce a product? And we produced the world's first squeezy. And it was called the Lepin F for Fordyce, R for Rose, who was the South African marathon champion, and myself. Squeeze, and it became the original carbohydrate syrup gel product available to endurance athletes. And I apologize for producing that because <laughs> <laughs> we've caused a lot of tooth decay and a few other things as well. But so then this is, we're going along strongly and then someone, Dr. Finney, comes along with this study. And he says, no, actually the, the humans can adapt to, to fat and I'm sure he will tell you more about his study. And so I'll just briefly remind you that in his study, he took five people, they adapted a ketogenic diet for four weeks, and for some of the athletes, they did actually better on the diet, they did better, and some did worse, and uh, so that was the evidence that we had. And this had a huge impact on my life, and it had a huge impact for one very important reason. 
that within about a couple of weeks of this study being published, I got a phone call. Okay, so we've got that one. I got a phone call from Paula Newby Fraser, who many of you won't know, but she was a South African who had gone to San Diego to become a professional triathlon triathlete. And she phoned me and she said, Tim, I've just read Dr. Finney's study, and he says, you know, maybe if you eat more fat, you can become a better athlete. And I said, Paula, go for it. Try it. So here I am promoting high carbohydrate diet, and I tell her, no, she must try the fat. So she goes ahead and wins the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon eight times. No one had matched that. And she's voted the triathlete of the millennium. And she misinterpreted my advice, and she started following a low-carbohydrate diet for all her career, and she does still. And she told me, Tim, that was the most important advice I ever received in my career. <laughs> and uh, so you can't train for the Iron Man on pasta and salads. And when you look at her, she's a carnivore, you can see. You know, that this, is, this is what carnivores look like. And she looks like that today. Um, she's as amazing as she was then. So during this period then, we are still studying the high carbohydrate diet and we're telling Paula to use fat, but we're not really believing it's all that important. And then we start to do some calculations and try and work out where's everything coming from. And we're working out exactly how many calories can you get from endogenous glucose? How many calories can you get from liver, from muscle, from inactive muscle, because you're getting lactate. And all the time we're missing the elephant in the room because there's the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is because we couldn't study it, it's very difficult to measure triglyceride disappearance during exercise. So we said, well, we'll just ignore that. It's not important. <laughs> and the only problem is, it's quite important, you see, because you have rather a lot more energy as fat in your body than is carbohydrate. So what did we say? Oh, God got it all wrong, you see. He should have put more energy here than here. We just made that assumption. And oh, you see, it's because when you store muscle, you store, when you store glycogen, you store water. So God was very clever. He just put a bit of water, a bit of energy into fat, and that was, but this is really what we should be looking, after, looking for. And yeah, it's been estimated that adipose tissue stores alone could supply sufficient energy for nearly four days of running compared to less than two hours using only muscle glycogen stores. So we just kind of ignored that and pretended it didn't exist until yeah, this happened. The turn point. And the turn let me just stop there. So, in 1989, the greatest endurance event in history happened, and it was the race between these two athletes, Mark Allen and Dave Scott, in the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon. And these two guys raced each other for eight hours and ten minutes. They ran neck and neck until the last three kilometers. And I questioned, now, they have run for eight hours, and now that you're going to watch their performance, and these two guys are going to run 2 hours 40 for a marathon, having run already, exercised for six, four to six hours. It's not possible. It's impossible. You can't do it. But we saw it happen, and we couldn't explain it. So, let me try and come back again. Now let me go behind it. At the turn point, and the turn point really is at 16 miles. You have roughly uh, is just a little under 10 miles to go coming in. I'll never forget that point. As we made that turn, I remember saying to myself, I said, Dave, the gun has just gone off. The race is just starting. Mark is feeling good. You're feeling good. You're going to have to wait. But here we go. I've got 10 miles of hard rain to go, and I can take this thing. So how can you run 10 miles hard with no glycogen in your muscles? That was the question. So I was invited to go to Hawaii and talk nine years later. And the reason was because Gatorade weren't funding it that year, so I got invited. <laughs> Those of you who know the history will, remember, will understand that story. So when I went, I said, well, the Ironman's impossible, and I'll explain to you why it's impossible, because here is Mark Allen running a two-hour 40 marathon. He mean, needs a VO2 of 53, percentage VO2 max, et cetera. But this is how many kilojoules per minute he's going to have to calculate. And from our laboratory studies, which we had done, we knew exactly how much energy you can get when you're running for so long. We knew after three hours, this is what you can expect. An average athlete who's going to run a three-hour and a half-hour marathon 
They can expect to burn 21 kilojoules a minute from blood glucose, 10.5 from lactate. So to make up the 59.5 that they require to run a marathon in three hours and 30 minutes, they're going to have to burn fat at 0.76 grams per minute. And no one had ever proved that was possible. There was no data. And our own data showed that the best we could get out of people was about 0.5. So we said, that's why it's impossible. And if you're going to run faster, now you're going to run a three-hour marathon at the end of the Ironman, you're going to have to burn 65 kilojoules. You're going to have to burn fat at 0.91 grams per minute. And if you're going to run like Mark Allen did, you're going to have to burn 1.15 grams per minute, which was clearly not possible. And the question then became, well, so if the metabolic model is true, for Mark Allen to do this, he has to be burning fat at 1.2 grams per minute. And we didn't think that was, was probable. But, uh, sorry, something, oh, so, yeah. But it was interesting because Mark Allen admitted that he didn't eat a high carbohydrate diet. He said, I eat a 40-30-30 diet, 40% 30, 30 carbohydrates, 30% fat, 30% protein. And I suspect he ate more fat, but that's not the point. So he has a guy who perhaps wasn't eating as much carbohydrate as we were thinking that he should be eating at the time. Dave Scott, of course, who he beat, was essentially a vegetarian at that time and eating a very high carbohydrate diet. And I just, for the record, report that he finally has seen the light and he's completely converted to the high fat diet. He did that three years ago after he read one of my books. And he now says a high fat diet is superior to a high carb diet. One of the benefits is it helps you recover faster. So we're just putting that on the record, but when he lost the race, he was eating a high carbohydrate diet and Mark beat him eating the higher fat diet. So anyway, we were inspired to do some research and to study the benefits of fat adaptation. And this study, I think, was the second study after Steve Finney's study. And so we did this, and we said, well, let's try to reproduce what happened to Dave Scott and Mark Allen. And, and so we would have the people exercise, doing high-intensity exercise, deplete their muscle glycogen, and then we would ask them to continue for as long as they possibly could. And guess what we found? We found that their time to exhaustion was much increased in the group eating the high-fat diet. So this is the first study, so it seems to show that the high-fat diet is very helpful. And despite that, of course, at the time I was still advocating the high-carbohydrate diet. So we then went and did another study in which we did a two-week adaptation now, and then we had the guys eat a high-carbohydrate diet for the last day or so before the experiment, and they did a 20-kilometer time trial. So this is to see, can you do speed work? And guess what? The high-fat diet was better again. So we had two studies showing superiority of the high-fat diet. And these studies are completely forgotten. They're written out of history. No one ever quotes them, as I will show you. Now, at the same time, uh, so that these two studies, potentially flawed as that might be, are conveniently forgotten whenever the Gatorade boys and girls review the evidence for performance effects of high-fat diets. Now, there's another study that the Gatorade girls and guys always forget, and this was a, the next study we did, that Dr. Louise Burke came to our laboratories in 1999, and she came with a placebo, a carbohydrate placebo, which had just been developed in Australia. She's from the Australian Institute of Sport. And she said, Tim, why don't we do a placebo-controlled trial of carbohydrate loading? So I said, gosh, that's a good idea. You're very clever that we should consider that. So we set up a placebo-controlled trial where they carbohydrate loaded properly eating a supplement that provided additional calories of carbohydrates. And they were then, for, for, the, for, the, for the crossover, they ate what they thought was more carbohydrate but wasn't. It was a placebo with no carbohydrate calories in it. And then we had them do uh, the trial that we normally do. And what we do is we have them cycle for 100 kilometers with, with speed work in the middle. So on the top here, they would do four kilometer sprints, taking about five and a half minutes, in which they produce a power output about 300 watts. And there they did four of them. And then they also did the one kilometer sprints, which took a lot shorter time, about a minute. And the power output was about 400 watts. And you can see that there was no difference. So guess what? The only study ever done of carbohydrate loading shows no benefit. And you, no one ever tells you. This study got buried. 
Okay, so what did we say when we wrote it up? The placebo control study shows that carbohydrate loading did not improve performance of a 100 kilometer time trial during which carbohydrate was consumed. And then I wrote this, so I'm responsible. So here we go, this is called ad hoc, when you change the conclusions afterwards, which you're not allowed to do. You tested a hypothesis, it didn't prove right, you've got to say, okay, we're wrong. But no, Noakes couldn't do that. So, <laughs> so by preventing any fall in blood glucose concentrations, carbohydrate ingestion during exercise may, off may offset any detrimental effects on performance of lower pre-exercise muscle and liver glycogen concentrations. That's completely unacceptable science. You're not allowed to do that and I apologize. We should have said, it didn't work, it doesn't work. And we're gonna meet Louise Burke because she was part of the, the trial and she's done some really good studies that we need also to investigate. But you, you probably will not find her telling anyone that this diet didn't work. Okay, then we did the next study, which was a PhD trial study by Liz Hoverman, who did a very similar study except we now had the ketogenic diet, it wasn't a high carb, sorry, it wasn't a carbohydrate loading study, this is a high fat diet. And these athletes, again, did pretty much a similar trial. It was a 100 kilometer time trial, and this was the time, and you can see on the high fat diet and the high carbohydrate diet, high fat diet followed by carbohydrates, high carbohydrate diet followed by carbohydrates, the, the end performance was not different, although more people did better on the high carbohydrate diet, the difference was not, not significant. And we would have had probably had to do 20 studies, 20 people to get a significant difference. But we did find one difference, which then became part of the law of nutrition for athletes. And again, this trial, the, the results are very similar. This is what happens, the one kilometer sprints that they did during the 100 kilometers. So they're cycling 100 kilometers. At this point, they have to do a one kilometer sprint, then they do another one kilometer sprint, another one kilometer sprint, etc. And here they do four kilometer sprints. And you can see that the performance during the four kilometer sprints was identical. So the time to finish was the same. The performance during the four kilometer time was exactly the same, but unfortunately, these three performances meant that the performance overall for all the one kilometer sprints were superior on the high carbohydrate diet and they were inferior on the low carbohydrate diet. So the conclusion came that you can't sprint when you're eating a high fat diet and that is what is written in the textbooks because of this study. But it's not true. Why? Because look here. The fourth sprint is exactly the same. This is a pacing effect because the people were unsure, they'd not trained on the, the technique, and they were uncertain so that they saved themselves to the final sprint. It can't be that they didn't have the energy because they finally, finally have the energy in the final sprint, so they had the energy here, but they didn't use it. So the, the story was written, in conclusion, the high-fat uh, carbohydrate dietary pattern increased fat oxidation but compromised high-intensity sprint performance. And that led Louise Burke to write an editorial, but, but not in the final sprint. Very important point. And that led Louise Burke to write an editorial in the Journal of Applied Physiology, Fat Adaptation for Athletic Performance, The Nail in the Coffin. So this is the one study that now destroys everything in the high fat diets, no longer of any benefit. And so she wrote a long story, but I'll shortly say it. Um, with growing evidence that this critical ability to sprint is impaired by dietary fat adaptation, Hold it, growing evidence, one study. It seems that we are near to closing the door on one application of this dietary protocol. However, those at the cold face of sports nutrition can delete fat loading and high fat diets from their list of genuine ergogenic aids for conventional endurance and ultra endurance sports. So this was the one study that now wiped out any consideration that a high fat diet could allow you to perform better. Uh, a few years later, she, she went back and she reviewed her statements again, and she said essentially nothing's changed because there hadn't been any more studies, and essentially there may be a few scenarios where low-carbohydrate diets are a benefit, or at least not detrimental for sports performance. So you can see that her bias is clearly against the benefits of a high-fat diet. She's expressed it very, very clearly. 
And then along comes the next, the faster study, which was Steve and, and Jeff's study. And they confirmed that during a high-fat diet, if you follow a high-fat diet, become adapted, you burn enormous amounts of fat during prolonged exercise. And they were able to show that humans can burn, high fat, can burn fat at high rates during exercise. And so now we have the second elephant in the room following their study, which I'm sure they're going to talk about, is that fat-adapted athletes can burn fat at very high rates during any form of exercise, potentially proving essentially all the energy required for most athletes in most athletic situations. And I'll show you that this is probably true, that the majority of recreational athletes will do extremely well, and they'll get all the, fat, all the energy they need from, from fat adaptation. So our next study then was to look at the liver and how does the liver function in people who are adapted to a high-fat diet. And we did this because we wanted to use it as studies to go on and study diabetes. And this study was published in the Journal of Physiology, and it shows that this is a population who'd been eating a low-carbohydrate diet for some months, 13 months. They were fully adapted, and they were eating about 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. The other group, who we met, were matched very carefully, they'd obviously been eating a mixed diet for much longer, and they were eating significantly more carbohydrate. And here, this shows how much carbohydrate was being oxidized by the group eating the mixed diet. You'll see that they're burning about three grams of carbohydrate for the 120 minutes of the trial, whereas the low-carb group are burning about a gram a minute for the duration of the trial. And then when we look at the fat oxidation, obviously it's inverse, and the fat oxidation is much higher in the fat-adapted athletes. And guess what? It meets the magical 1.2 grams per minute. So this was the 1.2 we were looking for to explain why Mark Allen could, could run his marathon. So that was, was really interesting, and this is obvious, follows from that, that the group who are eating the mixed diet burn a lot of carbohydrate during exercise, just as Jeff had shown, but our group burned a lot of fat, which they fat adapted. And so we, we conclude then that fat adapted humans can oxidize fat at, at 1.2 grams per minute. As a result, most humans can perform most forms of exercise just burning fat. And is that why we still saw so much energy as fat? That seems to be the biological reason, because this is the preferred fuel, probably. We also measured muscle glycogen disappearance, and it was slightly different from then Steve and Jeff's finding, and we found that the group with a low-carbohydrate diet had lower muscle glycogen, and they burned much less glycogen, as you can see, during exercise compared to the mixed group. And then we, this was kind of what we were really doing the study, was seeing where was the glucose coming from uh, during exercise, and this is the liver glucose production from gluco, sorry, glycogenolysis, that's the breakdown of glycogen that is stored before exercise begins. And gluconeogenesis is the ongoing production of glucose from fats and protein. And you can see that at rest, the only difference is that glycogenolysis is slightly less in the group on the low-carbohydrate diet. Then during exercise, both are increased. Glycogenolysis is increased and gluconeogenesis is increased compared to rest. And there is a slightly less increase in glycogenolysis in the low-carb group. But I must tell you that they were absolutely able to maintain their glucose during exercise. And the reason was because what, what you do, so the low-carbohydrate athletes have lower rates of total glucose production and hepatic glycogenolysis, but similar rates of gluconeogenesis compared to those on the mixed diet. And the reason they cope because they compensate for a reduced dietary carbohydrate availability by increasing glucose synthesis during, sorry, not by increasing glucose synthesis during exercise, but rather by adapting, by altering whole body substrate utilization, shutting down glucose use. And so that's the, that's the evidence. So we were able to show that that's how it happens, and athletes are able to maintain glucose homeostasis normally. So then we come to the final important study in this field, and this is Louise Burke's study, and it's, it's a brilliant study, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, this was an amazing study. They got uh, 21 world-class race walkers to come to Australia and train for three weeks, uh, either for three weeks, sorry, for three weeks, a uh, group of 10 for three weeks, another group of 10 for three weeks. And, this, and they measured an enormous amount of things. It's astonishing. 
but they made one big error, as I'll show you. And unfortunately for us, it showed that the high-fat diet impaired performance quite significantly. So after three weeks on the diet, when they were training intensively on the diet, the performance went down in the group eating a high-fat diet. Now, many would think, well, gosh, that, that's the end. But of course, it's only three weeks. But there's another major weakness of the trial. So here she, they conclude, in contrast to training with diets providing chronic or periodized high-carbohydrate availability, adaptation to an LCHF diet impairs performance in elite endurance athletes despite a significant improvement in peak aerobic capacity. Now, but unfortunately, you can't make that conclusion. And the reason is it's not a randomized controlled trial. And you have to read the study to realize that there were certain limitations, as you would expect when you're dealing with world-class athletes who are in competition and have got to go and compete in a few months' time. You can't get them to do exactly what you want them to do. And they had to make some compromises. And so Dr. Burke quite correctly says the design and implementation of, this, implementation of the study involved a pragmatic blend of rigorous scientific control and research methodology with real-world allowances needed to accommodate elite athletic populations. Now, we don't know quite what she means by pragmatic blend, okay? And again, she's a, she's a first-class scientist. Prior to the arrival to the study camps, participants were educated about the benefits and limitations of the different dietary treatments and asked to nominate their preferences for or non-acceptance of each of these interventions. So the athletes chose the diet on the basis of, of what they'd been told. And we don't know what they'd been told. And so there's the problem. So unfortunately, it is not a randomized controlled trial, and we don't really know why people chose what they chose. And you see, the problem is that Dr. Burke once said, Brooklyn and Noak should be in jail. So <laughs> I'm not, don't know whether that's what she said for, promote, for prescribing a high-fat diet. So I'm not sure if she told the athletes that. But if she did tell them that, they're not going to perform very well on the high-fat diet. <laughs> so, so anyway, but what she did show, and this is a point, this is to me the best bit of this data. Here, here we have the three groups. Of, these are, remember, these are self-selected diets. They weren't, they weren't forced to do it. Here was the high-carbohydrate diet. This is a periodized carbohydrate diet, and that's a low-carbohydrate diet. And here are the rates of carbohydrate oxidation and the rates of fat oxidation dur measured during a time trial over 25 kilometers. So this is the Taiwan kilometer, 13 kilometers, 25 kilometers. They came into the lab. They did their, a bit of exercise, and they went out and did their time trial again. So it was part of the time trial. And this is pre the first, when they, before they'd done the dietary intervention, that's post-dietary intervention. And you see the carbohydrate oxidation really doesn't change, nor does fat oxidation change with the people staying on the high-carbohydrate diets. But in the group on the low-carbohydrate diet, there's a massive change. So before the intervention, they're burning a lot of carbohydrates, and they're burning a lot of carbohydrates and not so much fat. But afterwards, you can see that they burn almost no carbohydrate. And to me, this is the key finding in the study, that at 25 kilometers, race, at race pace, they're burning half a gram of carbohydrate a minute, which is astonishing. It is so low. That, but you could never say that, that was, they're underperforming because they can only burn half a gram of carbohydrate. It can't be that. They could burn more if they wish to. And look at this. Look at that fat oxidation rate, 1.5 grams per minute. So this is the, the remarkable point of this study is that it's elite athletes, you put them on this diet for three weeks, you get this incredible conversion to burning fat from burning 0.5 grams per minute to 1.5 tripling of, of fat oxidation rates within a, such a short time. So my conclusion would have been that even when they exercised at their 50K racing intensity, carbohydrate use was almost negligible in these elite athletes who adapted to a high-fat diet for as little as three weeks. And it's astonishing. But it gets even better because the study, but sorry, the point was the study was not a randomized control trial and so can't exclude that the high-fat diet sorry, can't conclude that the high-fat diet impaired exercise performance. There's a probability of a placebo effect and all sorts of other things could explain it. So it's a fantastic study, but I don't accept the, the effects on performance. 
Firstly, because it's only three weeks, and secondly, because of the points I made. But it's still not the final nail in the coffin study. That's the point. And so here's the nail in the coffin anecdote for you. So this is a 50 kilometer race walker who could have been included in the study. I don't know if he was. And he inconveniently, <laughs> he went and won gold medals in the 2015 World Athletics Championships and the 2016 Olympic Games 50 kilometer race walks by ignoring the scientific proof. And what did he do? He spoke about his low-carbohydrate journey since 2014. I was concerned about my energy crises at 35 kilometer mark. My error was that I became too dependent on carbohydrates. We trained the body and muscles, not our metabolism. So my argument would be that great athletes and their coaches experiment, they listen to their bodies, they are not and should not be wholly dependent on the scientific literature. So my final two slides, I have to mention my great friend, Peter Rupner, who's going to come and speak, and he's going to tell you how he converted this team to a low-carb diet, and they won the world championships. But what he won't tell you is he also converted my favorite football team, Liverpool, to, <laughs> to uh, the high... Sorry. Uh, he, he told Liverpool who they had to select as a new coach, you see, on the basis that this is the one guy who will make sure they eat a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. And Liverpool had a great season and were European Cup finalists. So how do we know they eat low carbs? Well, I'm going to show you their coach, who's a German and who sort of, you have to listen carefully to understand his English, because he's an iconic and wonderful man. And so here's his story. Notes before, before, the, before the game, I, I read the funny story with somebody, what's that? <laughs> Now, this is uh, something to take back on the bus. As you know, Plymouth is uh, 293 miles from... Uh, I didn't know. There you go. Know. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't eat carbohydrates. <laughs> and I'm sure they're not. <laughs> no carbohydrates in, right? Yeah. Thank you. So that's the reason why... <laughs> so for those who didn't hear... <laughs> so for those who didn't hear, he said, unfortunately, I don't eat carbohydrates. Of his carbon hydrates, I think he said. So what are my conclusions? Until the late 1960s, world-class athletes ate whatever, what everyone else ate, less carbohydrates, more fat and protein. And this is terribly important. They ate what the rich people ate. That's what they thought you should eat to be a great athlete. And, and no one ever looks back before 1969 what people were eating. And I've spoken to Ron Clark and some of the world's greatest athletes. They said, we just ate what normal people ate, and we ate lots of fat and protein. The introduction of the muscle biopsy technique by Swedish physiologists launched the modern era of carbophilia and fat phobia in sports nutrition. <laughs> like the United States dietary guidelines, which are not evidence-based, the belief that high-carbohydrate diets enhance athletic performance relies more on conjecture and belief than on rigorous, rigorously controlled placebo-controlled trials, rigorously conducted placebo-controlled RCTs. There's been one in the trial. I think there's one. There might be two. That's it. But we never ask that question because we just accept, much like we accept the dietary guidelines. The biology of human metabolism makes it, makes it more probable that humans are designed to utilize fat rather than carbohydrates as the preferred fuel during most but not all forms of exercise. And I take that also from those elite athletes at Dewey's Burke study. How can you adapt your fat metabolism, quadruple it, in three weeks? It's because it's always there, and you've just got to take the break off, get your insulin down, and you'll start oxidizing fat. And then, this is a point that I didn't discuss at length, but since insulin-resistant athletes who constitute the majority of most populations tolerate high-carbohydrate diets poorly, the onus on those promoting high-carbohydrate diets for all is to prove that their advice is not harming a majority of those participating in physical activity globally. And I think that's one of the problems we have, is that many of the dietitians and nutritionists working with athletes don't see the medical complications of what happens if, like me, you eat a high carbohydrate for a long time, high carbohydrate diet for a long time. And I think that that's a terribly important point to remember. Thank you very much for your attention.